There's a reason you guys overwhelmingly voted this the number one pair of recreated jeans. It's pure classic in every detail. This is the crowning achievement of analog technology. Industrialization has reached its peak. This pair of jeans is made to go bigger, faster, harder than ever before. This is the 1947 501 episode, now on Dan and Denim. Ain't nothing goes better with a pair of classic blue jeans than a plain white t-shirt. But authentic vintage style tees are hard to come by. That's why I'm proud to tell you about our sponsor for this episode. Unbleachedapparel.com Unlike modern white t-shirts, which are treated with harsh whitening agents, Unbleached shirts are made the old-fashioned way, without the use of any dyes or nasty chemicals. Not only better for your health, but the environment too. These vintage-style tees will never fade and only look better with every wash. I love my unbleached tees, and I think you will too. So let them know I send you by using the code DENINDENIM at checkout. You'll be supporting the channel, as well as a great company dedicated to making clothes the old-fashioned way. This is the story of how man made a machine and perfected it by putting a soul into it. This is the year the land speed record was set at almost 400 miles per hour by John Cobb. He broke the sound barrier at 700 miles per hour in flight with Chuck Yeager and the Bell X-1 rocket plane. But it's two brothers from Inglewood who really capture the 501 story here. Hot Rod Culture had formed its seeds in Southern California in the 1930s. Sure, there were folks all over the country who were trying to make their cars go faster. But the setup of Los Angeles, with communities spread out over a large plain of land, with open roads led to a car culture-based city. By the end of World War II, there were dozens of abandoned military airports in SoCal, and these became the first drag strips. Vic Edelbrock would open his aftermarket modification store and give hot rod enthusiasts the parts and advice they needed to soup up their rides to something that could break 100 miles per hour. In 1947, brothers Bob and Dick Pearson bought a 1934 Ford Coupe Junker car for 25 bucks. Their plan was to be cool like all the other kids in post-war Los Angeles and race it at the drag strips. Hot rods of the time could reach speeds of just over 100 miles per hour. The Pearson Coupe would break 150. These amateur teenagers would crack the code to superior speed with their machine and inspire a generation. The Pearson brothers were the first to see the potential of turning a coupe body design into a hot rod. The typical chassis for hot rods had been rocket-inspired roadsters. The revolutionary idea they had with the 2D coupe was to radically alter the silhouette aimed at maximizing straight line speed. Its iconic profile including a 9 inch top chop, 3 inch channel, fender removal, and a midget racing car nose. The master touch though was the windshield. The racing rulebook specified a minimum 7 inch height, but there was no limitation on its angle. So. They fired up the torch and laid the post back to a dramatic 50 degrees. The 2D Coupe is the first with such radically slanted windshield posts. Bob Pearson would be the driver, wearing a pair of 501s. Hot Rod culture would continue to thrive throughout the 1950s, becoming a defining symbol of the youth doing what they do best, hunting the cool. This time equipped with fast engines and tougher jeans. Bob Peterson's Hot Rod magazine would go on to become an entire industry of car enthusiast magazines that continues to this day. The Peterson Automotive Museum is still a fun place to visit. There used to be drive-in nights at Bob's Big Boy in Burbank. But going to a car show and appreciating the car is more than just a means of transportation. It's part of American culture. You wear a pair of salvage jeans to one of these places and you will be amongst the most stylishly dressed. The story of the 1947 jeans and the story of post-war America are about amateurs perfecting the machines of their enthusiasm and imbuing them with a the soul. 
The steam engine that kicked off the Industrial Revolution was now a rocket jet that could break the sound barrier. It was a hot rod that inspired millions to modify their own vehicles. It was in the Draper X3 loom that would weave the denim for Levi's classic golden age. Both the 2D coupe and the Draper X3 loom were machines that had a soul put into them and they inspired the baby boomer generation. The 1950s really started after World War II and didn't come to an end until the mid 1960s. It's a decade that lasted 20 years. The whole time there was a growing population and the denim and car industries were booming as well. The two would become intertwined as kids saw both a pair of Levi's and a cool ride as essential parts to being a teenage boy in America. This is where cool was born. I exaggerate a lot about this being a tight fit. It is tighter and you should take that info into consideration. You can wear your true size, but you will probably fit better into one size up. If you're a 32, then get 33. And you would fit 34, maybe with a belt. Don't get 31 unless you want to punish yourself. I downsized on these and it shows. But I can fit into them. It just hurts when I sit, but I do like to wear them to concerts. The next 47 I get will be rigid and I won't wash it at all. I will use it as my wear from rigid pair. I'm a 31 and I would get 32. Upsize one waist recommended. These jeans are meant to sit halfway between your waist and your navel. The legs go straight down. There is no tapering below the knee, so it gives it a column effect and gives this illusion of widening out. If you don't want that effect, then you can hem the cuffs or get a pair of 54 501 Zs. They have a similar fit, but with a slight tapering below the knee. Neither of these pairs will be good if you have extra wide hips. You would do better with 55s, 22s, or not even 501s if it's extreme. 541s athletic fit would do you better. But for most folks, this is a pair that fits wonderfully. It's a perfect pair to become a second skin like the pairs you grew up with. Everything about this pair screams pure 100% classic. V-stitch, leather patch, concealed rivets, belt loops, big E red tab, red line selvage. Most pairs even come with yellow stitching on the arcuate. All the historical nonsense like a cinch or suspender buttons, crotch rivet, are gone. Historically in the late 1940s, some pairs of 501s were marked with green ink on the lot number. This is known as green stamping and is extremely rare. In 1950, Levi celebrated its centennial a couple years early. 501s came with an additional keepsake, the centennial pullout tag, telling stories of the rodeo, back to the gold rush. This is the first pair with double needle arcuate stitching. You can see how the machine overlaps the arcuate to create the diamond in the middle. If you go to Levi's Taylor and you order a pair of Lot 1, or you get a pair of pre-1940 Levi's, then they do a single needle arcuate stitching because it's done by hand. These jeans are all about the mastery of the mechanical age, yet there is still integrity in every part. This is the pair of jeans that is the blueprint for the jeans we still wear today. When someone wants to make a classic era pair of jeans, this is what they base it on. A lovely detail for crafting vintage jeans is the tuft of fabric exposed at the rivets. You will see this on most pairs before the 1960s. You might not see them in the 1954 recreations because they made the rivets concave instead of flat. What the 47s have that you also won't see in later years are steel buttons. Pairs from the 30s and 40s, except for the S501 war years represented in the 1944 pair, have these strong, smooth shank buttons. No indentations like previously, and made of steel, rather than zinc, 
as they would be starting in 1954. Why is it the denim heads are so obsessed about Cone Mill's denim? That they would pay more than twice the price to have a specific fabric versus the Japanese denims, which are also fantastic quality. One reason is that Cone Mills is no longer a viable company, and it means the denim was woven in the USA. Cone Mills had a factory they named White Oak. This is why we also call it White Oak Denim. For the LBC line, they made historic and classic era denim, woven on the machines from the time period. The plain white selvage of nine and 10 ounces was woven on loom state machines. In 1927, Cone Mills threaded a red stitch into the selvage denim to distinguish Levi's denim from the competitors. If you buy a pair of LVC jeans recreated from one of these historic years, then it would have been woven on loom state machines from the 1920s. However, when you buy a classic pair of jeans like 1947, 1955, or 1966, you are buying 12 ounce red line selvage woven on the Draper X3 looms, first manufactured in 1947. The Draper X3 loom was able to provide consistent quality denim for the 20th century as the Levi's and denim demands launched sky high. The Draper X3 loom gives characteristics to the denim. Over the decades that they worked on the machines, they found how certain inconsistencies would develop. The Draper X3 loom is described as having personality. It can operate well under several conditions and gives you a uniform denim with a few imperfections here and there that don't deteriorate the quality, but rather allow for unique denim distressions over time. There's a difference in how the 1947 versus the 1955 fades. And this is in big part due to how the rollers on the Draper are magnetized. Over time, the magnets will wear down. It wasn't until the 1960s that they were remagnetized. This gives each year of historic 501s and their recreations slightly different distressions as they were worn in. The weavers and repairmen who worked on the Draper X3s describe how they become one with the machine. They can feel it breathing and singing a tune. Just like the 2D coupe, the red violin, Excalibur, and the wailing wall. This is an example of man pouring his heart into stone. And that energy is received by this inorganic emanation to rock out, surfing the waves of the universe. We talk about men of steel, but Draper X3 is steel with heart. Old Drapey is more than just the weaver of denim. She's a character in the 501 story, just like Jacob Davis, Elvis, and you. Old Drapey made enough denim to put every baby boomer and generation Xer into a pair of jeans. It's the denim we fell in love with. As the production of the 1980s expanded into globalization, Old Drapey was tossed aside for more computerized machines that could pump out denim for fast fashion. The high quality denim being produced in Japan these days draws inspiration from cone mills and the methods used by the Draper X3 and it has a history all its own. Some of the Japanese weavers predate cone mills. Since the 21st century, Levi has switched to other denim manufacturers and reserved the last of the white oak denim for limited edition runs in the LVC line. If you still want new denim products woven on the Draper X3 loom, then you would be interested in these companies. Wolf, the White Oak Legacy Foundation, and Vidalia Mills. Those are two companies based in the USA that currently use Draper X3 looms to weave their denim. Wolf Denim goes under the name Proximity, and they made jeans and a jacket, possibly more items on the way. But the real scene stealer here is Vidalia Mills. They are producing denim with E3 cotton grown in the USA to distributors to make denim products. Check out Weiss Made if you want something completely made within California. There's also Old Blue. Heck, even The Gap is making some items from Vidalia Mills. Denim woven on the drapers. You can still buy jeans made entirely in the USA from cotton to weaving to stitching to store, but new from Levi's is a different story. 
This is one of the easiest pairs to find. There are dozens of variations and they have been made every season for the last 20 plus years. I hope Levi's will continue to make rigid pairs of 1947 style 501 jeans forever. This is a great first jean. This is a great first vintage jean. It is the prototype to all classic jeans. Getting a pair and breaking them in through tough wear is the height of the denim experience. Buying a rigid pair of 501s new and unwashed is the only way to get shrink to fit denim. And the only way to get the flasher and guarantee ticket. Two awesome keepsakes that transport me back to some of my best childhood memories every time I hold them. One note of caution about buying rigid jeans or jackets is that the indigo dye will rub off on any other clothing you have and anything you sit on. So if you want to keep that rigid look going, but you want them ready to wear and go with your best white t-shirt, then I recommend New Rinse. New Rinse looks rigid, but it's already pre-shrunk and the dye will stay as it is. And you don't have as much dye transfer onto other items. Now, let's go through all the distressed versions. I counted 50 variations of distressed 1947 501s. By far the most. Alamosa. Argyle Avenue. Arnie. Beaches. Bitter End. Blues 22. Bottle Rocket. Dana Point. Dark Star. Dark Trails. Dee Dee. Dust Storm. Earthquake. Ecotopia. Electric. Fine Strutton. Guts for Garters. Hard Rain. Horizon. Mammoth. Masonic. Memory. Moon Rock. New Rinse. Oh, Feral. Oh, boy. One I Love. Parkins. Pop Skull. Population Bomb. Ram Shackled. Wraithen Road. Reef Break. Rodeo Hero. Rosie. Rough Rinse. Royal Flush. Rumble. The Runaway. Salt Lake Bum. Scorched. Shadows Fall. Shanty. Slide Machine. Tanner. Tumbleweed. Vanishing Point. Whiplash. The White Noise. And for limited editions, there is a Japanese text pair. It's the third of the fourth that they've done so far of the Japanese Katakana text editions. Each one of them is highly coveted. Still, our next pair deserves its own chapter. The limited edition that stands apart from all the others is, of course, the Bing Crosby Tuxedo. This is for the high-class Levi's fan. Now there are actually four parts to the tux. There is a limited edition pair of 1947 jeans with the selvage line on the outside. It's running up to the hip where it's met in a triangular fold and sealed with a rivet. They are cool. But the matching blazer is really the star of the show. It has a rosette of 27 red tabs and four rivets in the center to form a boutonniere. Then, a leather label on the inside that tells the story. More on that in a minute. If you buy the blazer, then you should get it with a suit bag. It's not the coolest bag, but it is the official LVC suit bag for it. Either way, you want something to protect it in the closet. The final item that is part of the suit is the red shirt. It gives a boldness to the already audacious outfit. And is the part of the tux I see least listed on sale. They are all hard finds, but the shirt is somehow the hardest. 
Now, if you want to complete the suit, you'll want some boots. I would go cowboy boots on those. You can probably go fancy style over a rustic look here. I'm not sure what you're supposed to do for ties with this. LBC made a few bow ties in 2013, but they're very short styles. I would think more of a southern string bow tie would fit this look. But if you check out what Bing was actually wearing, it looks like a southwestern kid's blanket. But for the modern wearer, I would suggest completing the LBC look with the Stetson Collaboration Dakota hat. White hat, white boots, white string tie, red shirt, blue denim suit, that's putting on the Ritz Levi's style. Bing Crosby, America's crooner, was a singing sensation in screen musicals from the 1930s to the 60s. While being one of Hollywood's leading men, he represented the wholesome American man. He invented a new style of singing called crooning. He never cared much for the title, but it was descriptive of how a bird coos for its mate. This is the pre-Elvis panty dropper. Compared to some of the other contemporary Levi legends, Bing is much less macho than John Wayne, and not as socially heroic as Gary Cooper. But he was more along the funny musical lines. He could cut a number with Danny Kaye or the Rat Pack. He was the straight man to Bob Hope's psychopath. In Bing, there was something dopey yet utterly romantic. He got the name Bing from an old comic he liked called the Bingville Bugle. You can enjoy him in the most classic musicals from the 20th century. When it comes to denim, Bing was no stranger. Bing only did two westerns, but we get to see him in a pair of 1930s 501s in Rhythm on the Range. You can see the Levi's arcuate on the pockets. Man, he cuffs them higher than Andy Dick being 86th. This is one of those things you can only do with a rigid pair. Once you break in the denim, it ain't gonna stand up high like that. Can we talk about how cute this cow is? What a Hollywood beaut. I don't think this is the first time I've mentioned cute cows on this channel. Is this part of being a cowboy? Just admiring adorable cows? Ah! It's actually from his personal life that Bing loves his denim. Here he is at his ranch home in Nevada, sporting a 501-506 combo. Bing loved wearing denim throughout his life. He would have been under studio contract to dress more formally for certain events, but while on vacation in Vancouver in 1951, he and a fellow denim cladded friend went to check into their hotel. Concierge turned them away because of their casual attire until the bellhop recognized the most famous movie star of the day. The two had a laugh about it, and the story spread around Hollywood and up the Frisco Way, where Levi's thought it was the perfect marketing opportunity. You see, Levi's had a post-war plan to increase sales. They were about to celebrate the company's centennial, so they made a denim blazer personally for Bing. Something to say, I love denim, but I'm formal. In keeping with the running joke, Levi's put two patches on the inside for the wearer to display if denied lodging. One oilcloth and the other leather. Both identical text, stating that this was presented to Bing Crosby and signed by the American Hotel Association president, guaranteeing that the wearer shall be respectfully received at any hotel. While being a great publicity stunt for Levi's and a lark for Bing, the whole gag was pretty much a middle finger to the Canadian establishment that thought they were too hoity-toity to admit America's finest. But also an unapologetic demand to wear denim. I'm American and I'm gonna wear denim. If it ain't fancy enough for you, then how about a tuxedo cut? We'll even call it the Canadian tuxedo to remember who is the butt of the joke here. This story essentially got lost for the rest of the 20th century, but folks in North America kept wearing denim jackets and jeans, and the phrase Canadian tuxedo entered the lexicon. Besides Levi's, there's a Canadian company that has gotten into the historical aspect of the joke and makes denim shirts. If you buy the dark wash, then it comes with a label for admittance to any Canadian hotel. Touche, Canucks. To answer the question, 
where is Bing's original tux? That's one of those Levi's mysteries. The whole incident takes place throughout 1951. Bing was doing a movie called Here Comes the Groom. Groom, wedding, tuxedo, you see the thread. So the studios did the premiere back in Elko, Nevada, where Bing was presented the tuxedo by Levi's and displayed the original in the theater lobby, only to find it missing as the credits rolled. Bing's niece has been searching for the original tux since 1987. Besides the original for Bing, several replicas were made by Levi's in the 1950s for storefront displays. There is a distinct difference between the one Bing had versus the 1950s store editions and the 2014 LVC recreations. Only Levi's and Bing's niece know the difference for fear it might be forged. One possible hunch is that folk singer Ramblin' Jack Elliott might have it. He was given his by an antique dealer. He wore it performing at the 1995 Grammys. He spoke to Bing's niece about the tux and she asked for detailed pictures to identify the jacket, but he never got them to her. He did describe the tux as splendid. It's made out of an old fashioned, tough, thick denim that cowboys used to wear. Today's film recommendations are about hot rods. If you're unfamiliar with the culture, then The Tales of Rat Fink 2006 is a great documentary to start on. <laughs> but American Graffiti is the must watch if you want a great pick set in this world. It's George Lucas's most honest film. It takes place during the final nights of racing's glory days. Its intergalactic heroes are those with the coolest cars. And the voice of Wolfman Jack transcends you to the time period. The Wolfman is everywhere. If you've seen it and you like it, but you want a goofy ripoff, then you gotta check out Van Nuys Boulevard. It's trash cinema that became a cult classic in light of the revival of Van Nuys in its heyday in the 1970s, as seen in Boogie Nights. Sticking with some cult classics, Deuce Coop is a drama that captures the time period right and doesn't date itself to become too cheesy. I'm not saying it's timeless, but to a lesser extent, it holds up decently. The hilarious and campy flick Hollywood Nights is actually a riot to watch, and you'll see a lot of jokes that have been reused since. I've had this taste in my mouth before. Somewhere in the middle of those two is The Heavenly Kid. This is a great Father's Day movie. It's easy to watch and has some great moments. It takes place in the 50s and the 80s. Must be Japanese. And you might notice that there are a lot of 80s films about the 50s. That's because 80s directors grew up in the 50s, idealizing the time period. Being too young to experience the thrill of it, but being primed for the action. This is the first generation to aspire to recreate their childhoods, something we are way too down the rabbit hole with today. I mean, this whole channel is victim to that. But I'm not alone. I used to work for some top Hollywood attorneys and more than one of their offices was filled with dangerous 1950s toys. I'm pretty sure the economy of Japan would come to a crumble if collectibles no longer had value. But back to the films. If you're in the mood for something historic, as maybe the Pearson Brothers would have watched, then The Devil on Wheels is really the first hot rod themed film. Most of the car themed films of the 50s and 60s were left to campy cinema. But the idea of car chases in films really hit its cinematic peak with Bullet, 1968. And of course, it's filmed in San Francisco. Any recreation of this would just be imitation. If you are feeling like dipping your toes into some Bing, well, he's got three Oscars. Going My Way is considered his best. You get some singing and a great storyline that reflects on the changing youth in America a decade before it becomes the popular norm. Showing that life has been a constant rebellion of generations far before our genes. As a, as a matter of curiosity,
to the owner of this 501 gene. When World War II ended and raw materials were available again, Levi Strauss and company leaped back into heavy production to meet the growing post-war demand. Slim of fitting with no extra details like the cinch or suspender buttons, this was a gene that was ready for the changing times. The watch pocket rivets came back after their wartime hiatus and the arcuate was stitched on the back pockets after having been applied with paint through the war. But it came back in different form thanks to new double needle technology. The famed double arch stitch was now uniform in size. Hand design no longer subject to the skill of the individual sewing machine operator. Using a single needle machine. The red selvage cone mills denim was still the bedrock of the jean, as it had been for nearly two decades. By the end of the 1940s, Levi's jeans were aimed at the new emerging middle class. The 1947 jean was the jean of a new generation. This is the pair of jeans. It's the number one voted pair of LEC recreations. It's the pure classic era jean, and every year since has only diminished the 501's integrity. The story of the 501, and all jeans after this point, until the end of the series in 1984, tells a new story. To some, it's gonna be a story of decline. This is the peak of jeans, the real birth of the modern pair of jeans as we know it today. You probably got a pair already. If you are dipping your toes in LBC recreations for the first time, then the 1947 is a great place to start. They are easily available. You don't have to worry about all the historical details. You get solid 12 ounce denim, but you also get a leather patch, steel buttons, the strong details that define vintage denim at its height. If you're going for that biker look, anything 50s themed, or simply a classic style that hit its peak, then the 1947 LVC jean is the one to own. The 1947 pair represents the pair of jeans a wider audience started wearing. These weren't just for workers anymore. These are jeans for a whole new generation. For the denim heads, it's a core part of the 501 timeline. One of the top five most important jeans in the collection. Fan rated number one for its fit and details but also maybe because LVC has pushed this pair more than any other, save maybe the 55s. Tell me about your pair of 47s. What do you think of the Bing Tucks? Do you wear 501s and work in your car? Put it in the comments. You can continue the 501 series in the next episode with the 1953 and the Brando pair, or you can compare it to the second best rated pair of jeans in my most epic 501 video, the 1955 episode. Subscribing really helps out the channel. A special thank you to my Patreon supporters. Members get early access to the videos, commercial free, plus bonus videos and extra content. I'm Dan. Thanks for watching. Love your jeans.